previously on the Escape Goat podcast. I yeah, I can I can do without a lot of the stuff that isn't my Star Trek. Yeah, as yeah. we started by discussing, um, been watching Picard. Yeah, I've I've been watching Picard too. <laughs> um, Picard, I, I have nice things to say about it. Controversially, I don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> one of the nice things that I have to say about it is. I like Captain Jean Luc Picard, and he's in it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he—that's true. So that that indicates how much I'm reaching. Patrick Stewart is in it. it. There's a dog. The fact that he calls his dog number one is the <laughs> nicest thing <laughs> in the world, and so that's you get that from sort of the opening five minutes of the first episode, and it is downhill from there in terms of what you can get from that show. Mm. Um, Me and Isabel did discuss getting together as part of this podcast and discussing Star Trek Picard in in general, just because we thought you know people would want to yeah. talk about that and hear hear about that at this juncture. We've decided not to do that because uh, as of recording this there's been eight episodes of 10 aired so it would be you know even by our very unfair standards it would be unfair to yeah. judge it at this point yeah um we will judge it harshly when it <laughs> i'd imagine <laughs> so <laughs> i'd imagine so um yeah i I'm, I'm not impressed with it And now, the conclusion. The Escape Goat Podcast podcast series featuring the discussion of many different topics, flaws and all, based on personal whims and fascinations. Hosted by me, David Blake Fagiani, and several different guests. Fanta Zero. You're goddamn right that's Fanta Zero. I fucking love Fanta Zero. Yeah, it's the best of it. Yeah, I fucking love it. I've got a nanny state on the go. Nice. Me and Lucy got some more of that um, gin substitute stuff that we were on in dry January as well. Um, oh, God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like it, actually. I think it's uh, it's certainly the only thing, like a spirit substitute that I've had that's any, any good at all. Um, yeah. It's just because it's got a very strong juniper flavour, so it passes the time. <laughs> What a ridiculous <laughs> sentence. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to put a load of potpourri in a soda stream and it'll be about, <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be about the same. <laughs> and a lot cheaper. <laughs> oh, man. Got to make the best, the best of it. <laughs> oh, God. All right. So um, I'll, um, I'll just take a sip of this, isn't it? <laughs> right. ASMR. Um, okay.
Welcome to the Escape Goat Podcast, episode six, and I'm delighted today to be welcoming back um, our guest from episode two, um, and this is my friend Isabel McNally. Hi. Hello, Isabel. How's it going? Uh, not bad. How are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm all right. Yeah, I'm okay. It's uh, dealing with dealing with lockdown fairly well today, I think. Pretty buoyant. Yeah, it helps when the weather's absolutely beautiful. Like You can't go outside, but at least it's not completely dreary. Yeah, it is kind of helping, isn't it? I'm not sure. I'm not sure how it's going to be when it turns. You know, that might be a, a bit more of a, a bit more of a challenge. Um, yeah, that's when the riots and the you know the the proper post-apocalyptic bullshit starts. Can't wait the eugenics yeah. wars. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're on the tip of our tongues. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've asked uh, Isabel on today. Uh, to sort of continue or, or, or um, move forward a conversation that we were we were sort of nascently having on on episode two, uh, which was primarily focused on Star Trek Voyager. But during the recording of that episode, we we touched on the uh, then currently airing Star Trek Picard, and we we mentioned that we would uh, we'd like to talk a little bit more about that that series, but also just more broadly about the character of Picard and and uh, the way he's been treated by Star Trek uh, media over over the last sort of twenty uh, odd years. Uh, and to that end, uh, me and Isabel over the last uh, sort of month have, have done a bit of a loose rewatch. And the way, the way we did that is, we, I mean, not, not, of, not of the series itself, although, although we have seen a few of those, but we, we, um, we watched all the TNG movies or, or rather we watched um, Generations, uh, Insurrection and Nemesis. And that's because we watched uh, First Contact together uh, about almost a year ago now, didn't we? Uh, I think it was just more than a year ago because I remember I had a broken foot. <laughs> so that was, that was just over a year ago. Which you now have again. Yes, I broke my toe yesterday like an absolute genius. <laughs> this is great. This is, this is when we gather together. At these yes, times. it's our annual Star Trek broken foot scenario. <laughs> so we, uh, we, so we, we, we've recently rewatched all the TNG movies. And then uh, we, I mean, we'd already decided to do this by the time we, we finished the rewatch. But we, after wrapping up with Nemesis, um, we decided to watch All Good Things, the uh, season finale and, and indeed series finale of, of Star Trek The Next Generation, because... Uh, we uh, well, we wanted to examine it as a kind of alternative pre-movies finale to TNG, the original finale of TNG, and we've also, uh, for the purposes of, the, of this podcast, both rewatched Encounter at Farpoint, which is the uh, series uh, opener, the premiere of of, of Star Trek: Next Generation from from 1987, and we did that partly because all good things draws very heavily on 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 it uh, for for its content. So um, I'd, I'd like to focus mostly on all good things but i'm sure our conversation will expand into into the movies and, and indeed a little bit into star trek picard um but we'll focus on all good things mostly because we both both like it very much um yeah definitely yeah um so all good things uh aired uh on may the 23rd uh 1994 and uh it was directed by winrick colby and uh written by brandon braga and roald d moore who uh are two uh, big i'm sure as any star trek fan knows they're two big big hitters from this era uh, of Star Trek in terms of the writers. Isabel, what are your overall impressions of All Good Things? Um, I think it's a, it's a brilliant piece of TV. It's so adventurous um, in its scope. You know, for a, a series that doesn't really have a set end, you know, they're on a continuous mission. It's, ve- it's, a va- it's vague what their scope is. So how do you bring that to an end? You've got to do something special. And I think All Good Things definitely does that. It does something really special that you just don't expect you know you expect to be some huge final showdown in a lot of tv finales but whilst it's dramatic and a lot of stuff does happen it just goes about it in a really unique and inventive way Mm -hmm. do you remember um do you remember seeing it for the first time um yeah I, i remember it was i wasn't old enough to experience it the first time it aired, like I was alive, but I, don't, I wasn't old enough to remember it. Um, it was reruns that were on BBC Two, so it, like I was watching it consecutively, but on a rerun. And I do remember that one, you know, it coming to an end and not knowing whether they were ever going to show um, The Next Generation again. And The Next Generation is my personal favourite of all the Star Trek franchise. Um, and it's, I do remember having this sort of sense of grief and thinking you know listening to the the theme tune on the, uh, when the episode started and thinking it might be the last time I ever heard that theme tune you know we were, we didn't have 
videos and stuff in the house. The only videos we had were stuff we'd taped off TV. In hindsight, I should have asked my mum to take it off TV. Mm. Um, but yeah, there was this sense of like um, anticipation that I was about to go through this bereavement and losing losing my captain and losing my crew. I think it was it was uh, all good things. Probably I saw it probably in '95 at some point on on BBC Two, and I yeah. it was it was almost at the start where I'd become. Uh, at about the age of 10 I'd become like a really um, quite serious Star Trek fan in the sense that I had an idea of the ordering of, the, of, of it and and the fact that it was drawing to a close and I'd started probably about about that same time watching Deep Space Nine on um, Sky um, recordings that my dad's mate had like rec- taped, it, taped a load of DS9 off Sky before we had anything like that and, and sent them over yeah. so so I was getting a, a kind of um, more of a sort of systematic awareness of the whole franchise, I, I suppose. And I think uh, we'll touch on this later, but I, I, I went to, I probably would have seen the Generations movie in the cinema not that long after. Um, after obviously, yeah. obviously they, re- they really rushed that out after uh, Star Trek Next Generation, which uh, you, you can see <laughs> some evidence of that in Generations. Um, yeah, I guess I think with like Generations and Deep Space Nine, that they, they were quite, you know, they were, they were there as your safety net as soon as TNG ended. So I think it was just sort of um, like a grief management process <laughs> that the producers went through to make sure that everyone had a crutch <laughs> for the loss of TNG, and that was Generations and DS9. It's something that you have to, uh, well, I've, I've had to sort of educate myself on this on, on, uh, over the last few years, but uh, it, it's, it's hard to recall how, it, I suppose, especially in the United States, what a huge show Star Trek The Next Generation was. It was especially for a sci-fi show i mean i mean we're we're talking about sort of the mid 90s we're talking about bygone eras in terms of uh, mainstream audience viewership you know like of this being on on a network and having uh, you know tens and tens of millions of viewers um yeah. but it, it was almost a, i think the end of tg was almost like something akin to the ending of mash you know not quite that big but you know it was it was it was proper event television and not and not and not even event television in the way that say something like star trek voyager only only about seven years later had, had become a bit niche already and it, yeah, it was, it was of the era that, you know, people did get together and watch, you know, look pre, pre-Netflix pre era, because now you get a series and people binge watch and do it in their own time, but everyone did sort of get together on that evening that that was going to be shown and you'd have an enormous viewership and it was the thing that everyone was talking about the next day. Mm. And I, I'll try and find a citation for this uh, and put it in the show notes, but I, I believe Star Trek The Next Generation, I mean, as, as any show with that audience would have, had quite a sizable, you know, a, a, an appreciably large female viewership, um, which obviously, yeah. there were, you know, there have been female Star Trek fans obviously since the start of the franchise, but, and then a lot of them carried it through the kind of, you know, the wilderness years between the, the original series and TNG, but I think um, TNG... For, for, for you know for, for, for many reasons successfully brought on board a large um, female fan contingent um yeah and, uh, which which i suppose is, is in some ways if we're talking the mid 90s has is kind of prefigured some of the sort of vibrant female fan communities that have, that have fed into you know in a very noticeable way have fed into sci-fi and fantasy tv uh, yeah. in the last 20 years i think one of the things that tng did well was um get a female voice in the writing staff um because it was during tng that they made I want to say Jerry Ryan, but it's not Jerry. Jerry Taylor. <laughs> Any excuse to bring up Jerry Ryan? <laughs> yeah, you know me. <laughs> yeah, Jerry Taylor onto the like she was chief writer, and you can see that shine through in the the female characters. There there is a female voice to it. They're not just these female characters like in the original series who are essentially eye candy. There's a lot of depth and humanity to the the female characters. You know, you bring. Beverly Crusher, who's got all this trauma to her and is trying to raise a child, and you know that, and the the female presence in the relationships, Troy's relationship with Riker, isn't really a relationship because she holds him at a distance because she knows that he just wants a Starship Command and she's going to get hurt. So that I mean, the the women have like a force and a presence in the relationships they have. They're not just there for men to have relationships with when the men choose to do so mm. or certainly not the main cast members there's a fair amount of uh, guest character <laughs> oh yeah right riker's uh <laughs> riker's conquests yeah that's, well, Riker... that's, that's the next spin-off that i want to see yeah or well, riker or uh well i mean troy and uh crusher have, have a fair few conquests as well we don't really yeah. need to touch on sub rosa in this but uh <laughs> <No>. <laughs> can do that some other maybe we can do a commentary on sub rosa um <laughs> I think, I mean, what you say about Jerry Taylor is, is, is interesting because she, she obviously went on to be um, an actual showrunner, well, one of, one of the showrunners on Voyager uh, in its sort of mm. midsection. And uh, the writer of this episode, or the co-writer of this episode, Brandon Braga, 
uh, went on mm. to um, steer Voyager for, for for a little bit in the later run, and and obviously Ronald D. Moore, the other the other writer of all good things, um, went on to be a sizable uh, creative force on uh, Star Trek: Deep Space Nine, and then and then and then the Battlestar Galactica reboot. So there's there's, there's a lot of I mean, even from a 1994 perspective, there's a lot of TV pedigree here, um, but they, they went on to feed into Star Trek and sci-fi TV after this as well. I, I, I was on this, on this rewatch of All Good Things to get, to get more into the, the meat of it. I, I was, I mean, I, I, I really love it and, and I've seen it many times and it's, it's such an easy one to rewatch. I think there's a good argument to be made that it's, it's right up there with the best episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, not just as a finale, um, but it, it just is one of the most rewatchable and sort of rich episodes. Um, yeah. One thing, one one obvious thing that I noticed this time around, maybe more explicitly than than normal, is is that it it's, it it draws quite heavily on a Christmas Carol structurally. Yeah. And I was thinking, you, you know, that the, in the most obvious sense, because it shows you uh, the past, the present, and the future, and specifically a future yeah. that can be averted, can be can be changed, and and perhaps should be in some ways. But it, I mean, even even just the way that um, Picard is introduced right at the start of the episode. Um, Walking out of his uh, quarters in in night dress, you know, practically asking what yeah. day is this? In fact, in fact, doesn't he ask what what day? <laughs> you is there, this? boy? <laughs> yeah, he does. He asks what. <laughs> Bring me the biggest space turkey in the shop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He may as well have just been holding a little lantern, roaming around the streets. But yeah, yeah, it is basically um, a Picard Carol. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Well put. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the things that allows it to be so resonant with the the whole history of the series, doesn't it? Because um, it artfully dips back into the very very start of the series, and and um, by revisiting the events of Encounter at Farpoint, and uh, you know, erstwhile characters of the show like Chief O'Brien and Tasha Yar, uh, mm. and as and calling on all the aesthetics of, of of that part of the series, and then balancing it with the present day of the series. In other words, the end of the series. And then yeah. postulating this um, projected future, I, I was—I was—I think one of the things I was saying to you before this chat was was that it sort of manages to be almost like the best clip show ever because yeah. I was thinking about—I I don't know if you've ever seen the end of Seinfeld, but you know um, Seinfeld has a um, a, a dramatic, you know, sort of inappropriately dramatic ending. Some people would say, but it, it it also just the penultimate episode of Seinfeld is just a clip show, like a fairly standard right. '90s clip show, and I think this kind of this this kind of manages to wrap all that up in a much more artful way, you know. It gives you yeah. it gives you all that nostalgia for the series, doesn't it? Yeah, is I mean, it's self-referential, obviously not just in terms of the plot of the the overall series, but it's it's a it's a pat on the back for the producers that you know, looking back to where they started, to where they've arrived, and what they've been able to do in that time, and you know, it it is excellent for giving the I think everyone that's involved in the show and everyone that's a fan of the show, this sense of closure and, and just showing you how long you've come on the journey. So, you know, your average 90s clip show, you would always look back at clips from a few years ago and be like, oh my God, look at the, look at how they're dressed. <laughs> and look at, look how 90s that hair is and stuff. And mm. you, you get the same kind of thing. Like Councillor Troy season one, um, outfit is just completely different to what you see even in the later series and it's an opportunity to sort of recognise that and look back and, and see how far we've all come together during the course of the show One thing that I really appreciated uh, on this rewatch was um, structurally I suppose in terms of character focus it, it creates a lot of room for the rest of the TNG cast it's definitely a Picard episode it's a Picard centric episode mm. but it really manages to incorporate the crew very well and we'll we'll revisit this when we talk a little bit about the movies because they they don't <laughs> um but one one thing I know is just you know in the in the past it will just I'll just refer to it as the past the present and the future but in the yeah. past timeline you, you're at a point in in the encounter at far point events where they've not picked up Riker yet he makes a brief appearance on a view screen they've not picked yeah. up Crusher um, so it gives you more time to focus on Troy uh, and uh, to obviously Tasha Yar um, and, and Chief O'Brien and people like that. Um, and, and, then, and then in the future timeline, they, they, they say that Troy has, has died. So that gives you yeah. more time to feature on Riker, who isn't yeah. in the encounter at Farpoint timeline yet. And obviously the future timeline focuses quite a lot on Beverly Crusher as well. So it's, yeah. really, it's really well balanced. You know, it, uses the, it uses the structure of encounter at Farpoint the strange two-part structure of Encounter at Farpoint to actually create room for everyone yeah, to, to remove, to Yeah, remove some characters to let other characters shine. 
Yeah, that's that's a very good point. I actually hadn't considered that. Well, I, I don't think I really consciously had until this this view through, and it's re- it's it's really well done and effective. And I think it it also you have surface level th- things like Picard um, being very you know moved and, and s- sad to see Tasha Yar uh, in, in the in the past timeline, but you also yeah. allow those past timeline and even present timeline characters to sort of haunt the future, don't you? Because by showing you Troy in the past, you know, and the present, you, you kind of, you em- emphasize like future Riker and future Worf's sorrow at having lost her. And, and you, yeah. you keep reminding people of her presence by jumping around in the timeline without having to really heavily underline it, you know? Yeah, I think that's, it's, it's part of the theme of the whole, well, that episode, but the whole show really is, there's that so, sort of sense of trauma and loss and how people carry it with them. So the loss of the likes of Tasha and Troy, that they're never really lost that, that that haunting is still there and and that's just something that's always a recurrent theme throughout TNG I think is I mean Tasha Yar gets reincarnated multiple times after her death um and you can never really escape those things you have to sort of face them you don't run away from them and that enormous trauma theme that is in TNG is is really really highlighted in the way they treat the characters in the final episode I think one thing that Star Trek's um, at its best is quite good at is 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 providing the, the character ensemble with with a kind of a really felt past, you know. And I think I think well, I don't know. I, I suppose I'd argue Deep Space Nine does that the best of all for me, but um, mm. but, but TNG is not far behind. And I think it's it gives you characters maybe more so than the original series, although there are are elements to this. It gives you characters with a past right from the very start, doesn't it? From Encounter at Farpoint. I'm not saying all these things are well sketched out at first, far from it. Yeah. But but with with as you were saying, Picard and Crusher, um, uh, Troy and, and Riker, you know, and, and you'll you'll within the first season you get into elements of, of Worf and Data's backstory, Geordie's backstory, etc. Um yeah. there's a sense of, of it being a bit grown up, isn't there? You know, the, the very fact that these people have prior relationships, that Crusher has a son, that Troy and Riker are an ex couple, you know, it it's yeah. and, and that Picard is an older man and that you know again, within that first season of TNG, you've, you've got reference to his stargazer years, you know, in the way that yeah. you didn't... I, I mean, I know, I know I, I, I vaguely remember that TOS gets into sort of postings Kirk had been up to a little bit. I think he was yeah. on the Farragut, but you never, you never get that kind of lived-in feel uh, that you get with sort of older, more, more experienced characters. Yeah, I think th- there is that kind of sense that they're all, they've all arrived on the Enterprise with their own baggage, and whilst they, they're sort of going through all these explorations all these new experiences they're all unpacking their personal baggage at the same time and you you do get a real sense of that and I think it just sort of crashes together quite dramatically in all good things you know there's a sense of urgency of unpacking all this baggage and there's this just sense of awareness that everyone is so damaged and particularly Picard you know he really has to fight for people to believe that he's jumping through time and space but luckily he's that close with his crew that i mean there's you know there's a point at which beverly says jean Luc picard wants to go on one last adventure that's what we're going to do even if she thinks like, her medical opinion is the guy's just losing his mind she's like i've trusted this man with my life for years and years and i'm gonna do that again one last time so we all sort of hold each other's hands and go on this really dangerous journey together just through sheer act of family and mm. there's something really like beautiful about that there is and it's got a it's got a lovely tender feeling to it hasn't it without um eliding any of the rough edges uh of of future picards well of, of picards general situation but of future picards irritability and and mm. you know difficulty in expressing himself and, and relating to people I, I, one thing i really like about future picard is is the in in all good things is is he is kind of um difficult but it happened it was real. I was there, back on board the Enterprise. How'd you like your tea? Tea? Pearl Grey, hot. Of course it's hot. What do you want in it? Nothing. Oh, Data. I must say, this is a fine place you have here. You certainly treat professors very well at Cambridge. Holding the Lucasian chair does have its perquisites. This house originally belonged to Sir Isaac Newton when he held the position. It's become the traditional residence. Here you go. Thank you. If you're really his friend, you'll get him to take that grey out of his hair. Jessel. Looks like a bloody skunk. (laughs) She can be frightfully trying at times, but she does make me laugh. 
Data, what is it with the hair anyway? Well, I found that a touch of gray adds an air of distinction. You said this is all gray. I'd swear that it was Dodge Ealing. Mm. Captain, how long has it been since you've seen a doctor about your iromotic syndrome? Week. You know, they, they have the, the mm. courage to make him difficult because obviously people with, because, you know, in some ways his temporal dislocation and this is standing in for elements of, of mental illness yeah. and, and slippage. Dementia, you know. yeah. Yeah, and, you know, and especially it's portrayed very sensitively that way in the way that the crew relate to him, you know, mm. uh, even though they've not got the full picture. Um, but I like that they, they're, they're not afraid to make him difficult, to make him abrasive, to make him acerbic, you know, because... I mean, you go back to Encounter at Farpoint. I mean, it's really it's very difficult to relate to Picard. You know, he's he's not he's not innately portrayed as a very sympathetic character. He's capable from the start. Yeah, but I, I like that that doesn't stop being part of his DNA. You know, I like that that's still part of him. Yeah, I think the the character of Picard consistently throughout TNG he's quite stoic, reserved. He's a bit enigmatic, and that he doesn't let a lot show. You know, he's quite sort of unattainable in terms of like who he is at his core and you but you do get these flashes of vulnerability throughout the series and then when you see him in the future in all the things he is so vulnerable to the point that he is frantic you know he's got this really frantic energy which you really haven't seen with him before like you've seen him get pissed off you've seen him shout but there's a very different energy to him in all good things which I mean, it's good to see them be inventive with his character and allow him to behave in a different way. But as a fan who's been sort of part of his crew for the past seven years and seen him behave in a particular way, there's something kind of terrifying about seeing him behave with this frantic energy. It's one of the things that makes All Good Things a difficult watch mm. because it's it's quite uncomfortable to see your captain not behaving like your captain and you know that does tap into the the sort of dementia and, and mental illness that kind of thing it's very uh we're making it sound like a like a chore all good things uh, but it, we don't mean it that way it's it's not gru- <laughs> it's not grueling it but it is very emotional like it's very yeah. i mean if, if you care about the characters and 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 the show it is it's quite a it's quite therapeutic really in some ways all good things i think for, for like for the characters certainly but maybe for the fans as well yeah, I find it that way. I mean, it like it is a very emotional watch, just because, as I said in the episode two podcast that we did about Voyager, TNG is my favourite Star Trek. Is you know that's that's my captain and my crew. So when I watch all good things, and I, you kind of experience the whole thing in once, and it, it you know it can be quite can be a bit overwhelming and confronting because you experience in the past, present, and future. But it's also cathartic at the same time, just to to sort of let that wash over you. You know, it's not it's not a grueling thing. It's it's a lot, but you can experience it in, in sort of a, a passive and therapeutic way. You you just sort of like let it happen to you. I also like the um the the sort of especially in the future Picard scenes that the ambiguity about um you know. Because you could you could easily portray this as like present Picard is the real Picard and he's body hopping mm. you know in a quantum, it's very quantum leap actually he's, he's built body hopping yeah. into, his, into his previous self and I think that's mostly how it's portrayed when he's his past self but I like the way that his future self is given a sort of authenticity like a sort of it, it's almost like he comes to himself and he remembers things you know, you know Riker will say something like you know you remember Troy died then and he's like yeah of course I know you know like it, it's, yeah. it's kind of it's not quite as simple as present Picard just body hopping and being completely ignorant of where he finds himself. It's yeah, like it's quite dreamlike. It's like it's like hopping. It's genuinely like hopping between quite porous realities and coming to you know the the, the feeling of coming to yourself you have when you wake up from a dream. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he gets more and more control over himself. He becomes more self aware as the episode goes on. So he's really sort of scared by it at first, and he's trying to figure out what. But once he understands what's happening, right? I'm got these three different times that I'm jumping between he's got this um kind of assertive kind of air he'll just like hop into one body and be like right okay I found this out guys this is the information we're using get this done as quickly as possible because I might be off in a minute and he, you know he's he gets this authoritative air and it's nice to see him do that as future Picard a bit as well because he was so vulnerable and then he, he gets to be back in command not only of his crew but like of himself and it's nice to watch that happened for him and it's a, there's a sense of relief that he isn't just completely mad and senile 
and that's partly why those chromatic scenes are, are, are great fun, isn't it? Because you do get, and I'm, I'm, you know, if one were to have a bit of a thing for Patrick Stewart being commanding, and I'm not saying you do, Isabel, uh, mm. then one, one might enjoy those well, scenes. Well, I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> <laughs> There's a the, there's definitely an earned um, pleasure in, in seeing him regain control of his faculties in that sense, isn't it? And, and Marshall, like Star Trek's always had a bit of, um, I, I think people have um, called it sort of um, functionality. You know, watching watching talented people do their jobs well. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, it's always had a bit of that to it, and 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 that as Picard musters the resources of his own mind and of the crews in three time periods, and and you know, in in the climax of the episode, actually, literally uses three versions of the crew to to solve the same problem. There's, yeah. there's, it's very satisfying isn't it you know it, it's 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 nice because you've because you have earned it and you've kind of gone through this this difficult dislocation and and, and panic and kind of fever almost you know you, you you've you've earned the climax of it yeah and i think with with um with the, the difficult job that the producers had was to how how to make something climactic without killing off a load of beloved characters and you know how to how to do that and and or just have like arbitrary conclusions to long running. You know, they could have just end. They could have ended with Jean Luc and Beverly's happy ever after, and you know, they could have done stuff that would have been quite sudden and wouldn't have resolved a lot of the long term issues that they'd had as a budding almost couple. But they didn't do that. They they showed you that in the future they got married, but they also showed you that they got divorced, and they don't do the happy ever after thing they give you like a little bit of what you want as a fan but it's it's sort of acutely realistic you know there's there is this sort of really sad future to look forward to mm. where picard's on his own in a vineyard going mad it's it's sad but i mean we'll, we'll, i think when we touch on picard later i'll get into this but I, what i like about the future is it is sad and there are worrying elements of it and there's obviously that genuine grief in terms of loss of troy but what i quite like about it is again that maturity of human relationships you know it's it's shown that there's, there's this 25 year gap and picard and crusher got married and then they got divorced but that's basically okay you know the, the, yeah. the, there's awkwardness of them and, and they can talk very frankly to each other and you again you get the sense that the relationship's deepened off camera you know but they are they're grown-ups you know they can they can still yeah. awkward they'll get they'll have an awkward hug and then they'll be able to relate to each other again you know it's yeah it's quite it's quite nice to watch them go through that because it's not it's it's not this earth shattering bereavement it's you know it's it's demonstrating that this these things happen these great things happen and these horrible things happen but that people are capable of healing and growing and and that essentially all these iterations of Picard are you know they're all perfectly valid Picards. That there's not there's not a wrong timeline here. Mm. It there's just different paths that people's lives can take. But ultimately, your you, you know your captain's got the strength and the resilience to go through it, and so does his crew. It's one of the reasons I, I like they comment on this explicitly, don't they? But you know, in the uh, in the final scene, just when the crew are gathered to play poker, um, which is a, a lovely scene in general, you know, especially yeah. when Picard joins them for the first time. But I, what I like is um, when the, the crew are discussing how Picard's let them know about this potential future, which they didn't witness yeah. for themselves, and he's he's kind of, you know, he's uncharacteristically told them about this future timeline with the the hope that they might be able to avert some of the less desirable sides of it, but not imposing that yeah. it's not imposing one view and there's no sense that it actually has been resolved there's no there's no specific sense of how much he's told them and there's also no sense in a nice way there's no sense of um whether they would even have the power to but any of this stuff or all of it and it's again it's, it has this maturity to it you know it's it they are collectively going to look out for each other a little bit more now and kind of be a little more kind to each other but that's not the yeah. same as it being a sticking plaster you know there's there's the, the world of Star Trek is still going to throw stuff at them over the next few decades, and they're kind of aware of this now. Um, but but the, you've still got to ride the wave, you know. You've got. To... Yeah, I think what what the what that ending does for me is because I mean TNG for like for me it's sort of Picard's story. Like he's the you know he's the captain, but he's also the central character. It's not. It maps his experiences, his trauma, very importantly. And I think what the ending does is he goes to this experience in which he realises that he cannot do anything without his crew and that this crew is his family and he needs to rely on them. And that when he sort of makes the decision to tell them to divulge information about the future that only he's privy to, which, you know, is probably the kind of thing that Starfleet would frown upon. He's probably not supposed to do that, but he trusts them and he does it anyway. And he then he comes and sits down at the poker table and he says he should have done it a long time ago. 
and for the first time in seven years you see that wall that he's put up slide down a little bit and you see him sort of become more vulnerable and, and let his crew in a bit and you know take a bit of his crew but give himself to his crew a little bit as well and having seen everything that he's gone through with he knows that he does have a legacy uh, but it he does have a family but it's just not the traditional kind it's it's everyone that's on his ship it's the ship itself and everyone on it you also see um uh, you know that it, there's a whole bunch of different sort of time travel episodes in in, in next generation alone and uh as with all time travel stories they're they're, they're always more if they're a good story that it's that it, because there's no real time travel to measure them against it because it to our knowledge doesn't exist it, it's yeah. always it's always interesting to see how it's used conceptually you know because obviously a lot of people have talked about you know the politics of time travel and the sort of implied morality of it but it, the rules are less important the rules the mechanical rules are less important than what your emphasis is and the the, the fraternal and, and family feeling of picard returning to the, the sort of bosom of his crew you know it, it's it's nice because yeah. episodes like tapestry also a q episode we'll get onto q in a minute show you an earlier younger picard who, who had that sort of camaraderie you know that straight out of the academy uh yeah feeling and and arrogance and boldness and brashness but also close friends and need for close friends and it you, you see him as you as you said before you know you, human lives are long and complicated and and people contain multitudes of themselves and you, you kind of see him for for seasoned fans of the show you can see him reintegrating elements of himself at the end there not just the ones that you've just seen in all good things but deeper cuts from the show you know like more introspective pieces of Picard everything from the inner light to tapestry you know and I think that's lovely yeah. too I think one of the difficult things about watching um watching Picard's journey throughout TNG is he, he obviously goes through a hell of a lot of trauma he arrives on the ship in the first place with a hell of a lot of trauma because of what he's been through um previously and and then the events on the Enterprise add to that there's a you know just been getting flung around space by Q because he's an arsehole and he likes to do that for fun and encountering the Borg but be, like being assimilated and every time you know he's already got a lot of walls up when he starts and every time he encounters a new traumatic incident he builds that up and up and up and you sort of see him you know sort of kind of like this hermit figure that hides in his ready room and doesn't let it keeps everyone at arm's length and one of the the good things that you get in that sort of like time travel narrative that you get for Picard in all good things is it forces introspection on characters it, it did the same thing in the um i can't remember the name of the episode but you know the, the one where uh tasha Yar, one of the ones where tasha Yar comes back but she she chooses to end her own timeline because she recognizes that Guinan um recognizes that she shouldn't be there yesterday's yes. enterprise yeah yesterday's enterprise um because it forces that introspection on tasha Yar as well because she has to examine where she sits in the timeline and i think it's it's just a bit of a a device for characterization as much as a plot device time travel is just puts characters in a position where they need to examine where they should fit in their own world yeah it's always it's like people say you know sci-fi is always about the um the present you know mm. it, 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 it it's it's the same fictionally like within the fiction isn't it you know time travel is always about reflecting the the main narrative present of of, of the show or of the work yeah and I think that I think that's constructive. I was just thinking. I'll, I'll ask you about Q in a second, but I, I I was just thinking, given that the one of Picard's main traumas is his assimilation by the Borg, and that the Borg are introduced and in some ways pointed at the Federation, or at least it's implied that way in, in Q Who by Q's actions. Mm. Isn't it interesting that in the canon, or at least the film canon, Picard never confronts Q about that? Yeah, that is interesting. I I think I I don't know. Picard's interactions with Q are minimal by design for Picard. He's, you know, he's not going to seek Q out to uh, give him shit about <laughs> introducing him to the Borg. Mm. Uh, and presumably, and he's a bit, presumably he's a bit too proud to as well, you know. He's that kind of yeah. character. Yeah, definitely. I, he, I mean, Picard's not the kind of person that's ever going to let Q know what a horrendous effect Q's actions have had on him. Mm. You know, he, he, he that, that one of the reasons that Q is such an annoying character is because because he he commands he can command more authority than picard he, just because of his annoying omnipotence 
Um, you're, not, and, you're not a huge key fan, are you? I'm kidding. He I'm kidding. Well, how dare he? <laughs> when you're on that bridge, you are, when you're on Jean-Luc Picard's bridge, you will answer to Jean-Luc Picard. I don't give a shit how all-powerful you are. Is it literally just because he's messing with Picard? That... Yes. That's <laughs> yes. It. That's fair. I, I, like, I, I quite like Q with, with, with caveats, obviously, and I love John Delancey. I was yeah. thinking. I, I was thinking that just if you if you did perceive Q as leading to you know being responsible for Picard's assimilation, mm. it puts a dark twist on the whole framing device for the series that they bring up here, isn't it? Like uh, on it being part of the trial, you know. Uh, yeah. And it also, it also, you know, because you can you can talk about Q as as being various aspects of God or or, or a God playing with humanity and kind of testing them. It it really gives an Old Testament uh, edge to it, doesn't it? Like it it, it would mm. make it would make him the God of Job essentially. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point actually. I think that I think the thing with all good things is because uh, obviously Q rocks up and you get put back back in that same trial room from um, Farpoint with the same sort of jeering mob that are shouting. That that's the first sort of clue that Picard gets when he's in that in the vineyard with them. Um, with Geordie is you see that jeering mob from the first episode. So it I was on that, on that I was just thinking, off. isn't isn't that a wonderfully uh, subtle clue? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I mean, you might not that. remember that. Yeah, you might not remember who these, what that is. But I, I think I do, I do talk about the trauma in TNG a lot. But it's it's kind of like this PTSD thing, where, you know. So the idea that he's sort of like a a war veteran that's come back and he's having a flashback to a traumatic event and i think the traumatic event was his entire time on the enterprise mm-hmm. for like from that point and and having q plant that seed in that very first episode that you are on trial for the crimes of humanity and you have to prove that humanity are worthy of existence so i think that kind of informs his character over the next seven years that he's he's even though the trial is over is it really over? He's still got something to prove. And then when you get to all good things, it's quite obvious that that trial is very much still going on and has been for the past seven years, potentially. Mm. And will continue, really. I mean, I mean, you, you, you don't have a sense of the conclusion. And Q actually says, you know, it, 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 will, you know, it will go on. And, and, yeah. and he even stops short of imparting some, some kind of ineffable cosmic narrative truth to Picard. I sincerely hope this is the last time that I find myself here. You just don't get it, do you, Jean-Luc? The trial never ends. We wanted to see if you had the ability to expand your mind and your horizons. And for one brief moment, you did. When I realized the paradox. Exactly. For that one fraction of a second, you were open to options you had never considered. That is the exploration that awaits you. Not mapping stars and studying nebula, but charting the unknown possibilities of existence. Q, what is it that you're trying to tell me? You'll find out. In any case, I'll be watching. And if you're very lucky, I'll drop by to say hello from time to time. See you out there. And just replace it with you'll find out, you know, which is yeah. it's nice. I and mean, obviously that couldn't be anything, you know, it couldn't be anything meaningful, but but I love it. It's, it's just a nice little whisper of, of closure, isn't it? Or, 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 or actually the, the reverse, but it, it allows the audience to, um, walk away with the story still still going on in their heads, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it just I think it validates the experience to an extent. You know that this this has all been incredibly meaningful, as is everything that will follow unwatched, untold. You know, it just imparts a, a real kind of acute sense of meaning and importance to everything that's been going on and will continue to go on. One thing that I really like about Q in all good things, and I'd noticed this when watching Encounter at Farpoint. Uh, towards the end of Encounter at Farpoint, Q is is sort of standing on the bridge and kind of I mean I mean the, the other crew can hear him and unlike in all good things and, and can perceive him, but he's basically talking to Picard. He's talking in Picard's ear. He's talking mm. through it. He's he's being an eye. He's being almost like a, a teacher, a teacher really, it, it, an annoying one, but one who's <laughs> who's trying to talk him through the situation and open his eyes to something. And that's kind of the cue they bring back in 
all good things, isn't it? I think yeah. I think the, in that sense, the premiere and the finale ni- nicely twin because Cusa is most insufferable and sort of uh, uh, superfluous, I guess, when he is basically just annoying the crew as a whole, you know, because then he is, really yeah. is the trickster god, he is the Loki, he is the uh, Mr. Mr. Plick, you know, from, from Superman. He's, he's that kind of character. Um, Q who I'd put somewhere in between. You know, I, I, I put that. That's a great episode, I think. But but he because he, he, there is a form of test or of trial as well, alongside the annoyance, um, and I think this is great at allowing you to get again closer to to Picard, isn't it? You know, I'd, in that sense, I'd put the Q and all good things up there with the one in Tapestry as well because his dialogue, his important dialogue, is with Picard. His relationship is with Picard, and he is both an antagonist and an unwanted irritant, and but also a conduit to solution and and a sort of twisted mentor. You know. Yeah, I think so. And I think that, you know, as for as much as I can't stand Q, I very much appreciate what he does to the story, for the overall story for of TNG, basically. So obviously he throws the Enterprise at the Borg, which ultimately leads to Picard being assimilated and all of that. But the Federation would not have been able to stand up against the Borg in any of its encounters were it not for that sort of early intervention by Q. It's, you know, he he does it like an asshole, but he shows the Enterprise what they need to see in terms of this coming threat of the Borg. Had, had he not done that, the Borg would have just turned up one day and assimilated Earth, basically. Mm. They, they had the power to do that. And I, I think you see that more in sort of, in first contact, really, mm. with, the, with the power of the Borg. He's very tethered to Picard, isn't he? And he, he does things for the show as a whole, not just the Borg's introduction, but, you know, in that very same episode, he sort of successfully amps up the mystery of Guinan, you know, and, and he... Yeah, you know, I love that. I really love that when Guinan and Q sort of see each other and Guinan does that. So, yeah, she does that sort of, like, cat-like um, posture against him. Mystic and Kung Fu. It, it really sort of... Yeah, and I, I think you really get a sense of how powerful and mystical... Guinan is as a character and that reflects really well on Picard and the Enterprise and that that's you know she's chosen to tend like this ancient powerful thing has chosen to tend bar on the mm. Enterprise you you get a sense that you watching the Enterprise on all its adventures you're watching something very special mm. because of her presence there she's fantastically underexplored Guinan isn't she and I think it's a real shame she's not in the in, in all good things which I, I assume was probably more of a, a 1994 Whoopi Goldberg schedule thing rather than anything else because yeah. she would she'd fit rather well in this wouldn't she in some ways I think she would but also I mean I think you wouldn't get the opportunity if she was there you wouldn't get the opportunity to explore what Picard's going through so much because you know full well he would just march the 10 forward and be like Guinan what the hell's going on and she'd have to help him but I, th- I think the Guinan equivalent is, yeah, so I think she gets her sort of finale in Generations because you, you do get quite an opportunity for her to sort of talk about her sort of knowledge and wisdom and, and her for her to guide Picard in, in that movie. Yeah, and, you, you know, Generations, partly through being so close to all good things in production, but um, also through its some of its subject matter, it is kind of... It, I'd say TNG sort of has two finales, really, doesn't it? It has, it has, um, it has all good things, and it has generations, and they both, they both wrap ups of, of that form of the crew and that kind of that look and you know, the ship itself, obviously. Yeah. But yeah, it's good that she's present in one of them. I think we 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 touched on most of the important stuff. I was I was actually I was thinking about asking you like favorite scenes and stuff, which you know, is is valid, but but I don't know. I mean, yeah. So I mean, there's there's certain, there's just certain sort of interactions and stuff, but. That are, that are nice to see in that episode but I don't mm. think there's any there's not it's more about characters it's more about watching the character growth and you know just seeing Geordie strolling around without his visor on I, I always mm. enjoy that I like, I like data at Cambridge <laughs> yes <laughs> he's got like he's got like the Isaac Newton chair hasn't he and uh, he's got yeah. that he's got that inexplicable Victorian housekeeper yeah <laughs> oh great heart. of course it's hot <laughs> She's a bit what like, do you want uh, in it? <laughs> she's a bit like Picard's inexplicable Victorian children in the Nexus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone has to have inexplicable Victorians. And Janeway's got an inexplicable Victorian family in the holodeck. <laughs> what is it about <laughs> Starfleet and their weird Victorian fascination? Oh, one thing I, well, I mean, we're still recording, so I can drop any of this in, but um, one thing I was going to mention was, uh, just because you touched on it in episode two, was uh, the, the fact that Q's fascination and sort of invasive fascination with Picard 
plays a lot, even though it raises awkward questions, it does play a lot better than his fascination with Janeway, which we you know we touched on in episode two. Yeah, I mean, it, the way that he treats Picard is sort of like a pet, whereas he treats Janeway just like a sex slave, basically. He just mm. turns up and demands to mate with her and shit, and it, that's not okay. Well, it's just, uh, it, it reminds me, it, on two levels, it's fun, isn't it, with Picard? Because it's A, it's queer as fuck, and sort of plays to <laughs> John Delancey's best, best things like that. Yeah. But also... Also, his relationship with Picard reminds me of that thing. Is it, um, is it in The Simpsons when you see a flashback where Krusty is trying out sideshows, like auditioning sideshows? Yeah. And he says something like, you know, it's, it's, no, it's no good if you hit him with a pie of the sap. You know, the, the sap has to have dignity. And like, uh, <laughs> and Picard, like Patrick Stewart certainly has that, doesn't he? So it's like, he's, he's kind of a yeah. great straight man to Q. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the things about, like, that maybe I should have said about Q is that for as much as... I hate him for how he treats Picard and how he treats the crew and how he treats people as playthings generally. I think his motivation is actually strangely noble. I think his motivation is to teach humanity its importance and its power and to teach us that, you know, we need to respect, you know, if we're going to fuck about in starships all over the galaxy, Mm. we need to have respect for how powerful we can be and you know he's he's like the enforcer of the prime directive basically in that he tells us to that you know we've used our power for a lot of horrible things in the past and he teaches us our responsibility and keeps our eyes on that sort of passive prize basically of just going out and witnessing and not fucking Mm. with stuff too much I suppose he's partly a way of, you know, I read an AV Club article about Farpoint that was talking about um, him being sort of the last of the original series, godlike beings as well, sort of bleeding into mm. the, the 90s, you know, the 80s, 90s era. But I suppose there's a sense in which he's kind of an, a, he's a usefully secular deity for the Star Trek universe as well, isn't he? Because he doesn't take himself too seriously, but he does have this huge cosmic power and he has this moral guiding aspect and this hectoring aspect, which, yeah. you know, Rod, like if you could credit it to him, Roddenberry's vision, such as it was, always had that element. Um, and he and he yeah. and, in that, and he's more usefully he's he's more detachedly secular than if you were going to get into the weeds with you know the prophets and DS Nine and stuff they are that they're, they're they're couched in very nice yeah. mysticism aren't they and and you know we talked before about how the Bajorans are, are so religiously loaded they kind of stand for every religion and Q is able to, so Q is able to examine some of those big questions about cosmic purpose and humanity's purpose but without getting too overtly religious. Yeah, I think I think the the thing about Q is it, it, it's an acceptance that that there, there is power. You know that that you know that it's not just all energies are in are in balance. That you know that there is avert power that can come from one source and that can overbalance and over overspill and and have a profound effect. But that doesn't have to be God. It can mm. it can come in many different forms. And Q's just like a bit of a, a stand-in for all of those sort of sources of power, mm. whether we understand it- them or not. Agreed, and it's kind of it's done relatively lightly usually as well, isn't it? And I think I think maybe allowing Q to be the prankster, the trickster in mm. in episodes, however irritating they might be, um, those episodes you, you you do you leaven some of the some of the heavy handedness and, and sort of that if you only got encounter at Farpoint and all good things Q, that might be a bit much almost. Yeah, definitely. You know, it would sort of overpower the series. It make it would make the entire series about that in a way, which which all good things lightly suggests it was. Yeah. But it doesn't it doesn't force your hand on that? Actually, one of the things in all good things is that um, in terms of whether we reference whether uh, Q is God or not, or the Q continuum is God, the fact that he takes Picard back to look at the primordial ooze, and he, you know, he didn't create it. He's he's not there to put that spark of life in there. He he goes back and shows him and explains the scientific process. These amino acids have combined to become the first protein, and he's he's just a objective observer of that process so i think it is quite explicit that that is not god mm, yeah or not yeah not our god or, or not the god mm. that not the god that created us welcome home home don't you recognize your old stomping grounds this is earth france about oh three and a half billion years ago give or take an eon or two it smells awful, doesn't it? All that sulfur and volcanic ash. Really must speak to the maid. Q, is there any point to all this? Look. Mm. 
So the anomaly is here too. At Earth. At this point in history, the anomaly fills your entire quadrant of the galaxy. Further back in time, the larger the anomaly. Come here. There's something I want to show you. You see this? This is you. I'm serious. Right here. Life is about to form on this planet for the very first time. A group of amino acids are about to combine to form the first protein. The building blocks <laughs> of what you call life. Strange, isn't it? Everything you know, your entire civilization, it all begins right here in this little pond of goo. Appropriate, somehow, isn't it? Too bad you didn't bring your microscope. It's really quite fascinating. Oh, look. There they go. The amino acids are moving closer and closer and closer. Oh, nothing happened. See what you've done? You saying that I caused the anomaly? And that the anomaly somehow disrupted the beginnings of life on Earth. Congratulations. It's almost like you could imagine God as a sort of relay race, you know, where we're sort of <laughs> shuttled between various, uh, various <laughs> powerful beings. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't wait for our weekend to stay at the uh, giant amoeba's house. <laughs> When, when he gets joint custody. Yeah, I want to see that court case. <laughs> the custody case of humanity, that'd be amazing. <laughs> that is exactly the kind of thing that would happen in Star Trek. Sole custody <laughs> goes to the Gorn. That's your ideal circumstance, isn't it? Ideal father. With all due respect <laughs> to my own. <laughs> to my actual dad. <laughs> ideal father figure. Imagine if I went round to your, your mum's house and you just like replaced all the pictures of your dad with the picture of the gorn. I might. <laughs> <laughs> no to, be, to be fair, he'd understand. <laughs> yeah, he would. It, it's his fault, really. He's the one that got you into Star Trek in the first place. So he did. He was asking to be replaced by the gorn. <laughs> On some level, aren't we all? <laughs> um. I think we'll, we'll we'll probably move on now uh, a little bit to to talk you about about the movies because I think we've covered it. I'm, I think we'll we'll delve back into all good things as well because there's there's so much to talk about. But um, but yeah, we'll we'll largely move on to to doing a, a bit of a discussion about about the subsequent uh, next generation movies uh, after this clip. What's the game? Five card draw, juices wild. Come in. Is there a problem, sir? No. I, uh, I just thought that I might, um, I might join you this evening. Uh, if there's room. Of course. Have a seat. Would you care to deal, sir? Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Data. Actually, I, uh, I used to be quite a car fair in my youth, you know. I should have done this a long time ago. You are always welcome. So, five card stud, nothing wild, and the sky's the limit. Welcome back. So, hi, hi, hi Isabel. So we, we're now going to after. I mean, we're going to revisit all good things a little bit uh, as we as we go yeah. along. But one, we're going to talk a little bit more about the, our impressions of the TNG movies um, on our on our rewatch and, and sort of just from from first watching anything that's occurred to us. I, I don't want to do a um, 
a, you know a deep examination in order or anything of, of yeah. each movie because because that would be imagine how tiresome that would be um, yeah I don't want to do that either no no that, let's oh, not <laughs> They leave you with a whole load of nope feelings, don't they? The TNG <laughs> movies. Yeah. I'm coming to analysis, um, but maybe we, we we can talk a little bit about um, our general impressions um, of them. And I, I'm kind of I'm kind of more interested in them as an alternative. If you sort of combine all four movies, well, I've already it's okay. <laughs> so I'll try and lay this out. So again, I, can, I, I think you can see Star Trek Generations as uh, an alternative finale to the Next Generation. You mm-hmm. obviously it's also got the Kirk element in it, so it's got the you know the, the, yeah. the cliche the passing of the i think torch. it's like a, a companion for la- finale of the first two series yeah yeah it is it's a, and it's it's a shared one in that sense as well isn't it mm. so i think in that sense generations is kind of its own thing and yeah, then I and then so. the and then the other three movies are kind of trying to answer okay what would what would tng movies look like then yeah yeah you know it, it's it's actually it's actually um Star Trek Generations has elements in common and I only realised because I was a Star Trek fan first and I've become a Doctor Who fan in, uh, later on um, I've realised that, that Generations for all its imperfection stuff it reminds me a bit of those the sort of multi-Doctor episodes in, um, yeah. in Doctor Who because the, the most of the, the reason for its being is to get Kirk and Picard together isn't it and there's, although they're different characters as Enterprise captains there's that the multi-captain um, multi-Doctor structure is the yeah. gimmick and it's, it's a big it's 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 like an anniversary special in that sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, it's got a different, it's a different package of feel good than, than, than all good things has. Do you, so I'll just actually show it because we'll talk a little bit about sort of an arbitrary ranking at the end. Um, do you think on, on this rewatch, do you think there's one of the movies, one of the four TNG movies that just works for you? However, you want to define that more than the others. Um, first Contact has a special place in my heart, generally. Mm. Um for me, I, I, I like Generations as a um, as a nostalgia piece. It's weird. It's mental. Um, it's a good little crutch after TNG ended. And Nemesis and Insurrection are kind of um, interchangeable for me. Mm. I mean, they're all they kind. Of, I I feel like they're all kind of quirky and gimmicky. Um, but First Contact works best as a movie, like as a standalone movie generally and I, it's just sort of an important it's an important um film for just the canon history of star trek you know it tells an important story uh, and i think it tells it quite well the first contact element you, you mean specifically yeah 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 no i agree with that i think i think the way i'd, I'd, I'd summarize the, the series is <laughs> to, to most star trek fans is it, having rewatched them first contact is not quite as good as you remember it but the other <laughs> yeah. three aren't quite as bad as you remember them, with 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 some exceptions. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, one one thing I one thing I unapologetically love about First Contact, and, and I think is really really good, is the score. Actually, I think the music. Yeah. Is, we we noticed that when we were watching it last year, didn't we? Just how good the score is. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's really well done. It's not overbearing. It, you know, it's noticeably good, but it's not in your face. Mm. And it's one of the few, maybe outside things like Wrath of Khan, it's, it's one of the few scores that you can kind of remember after the event. I can sort of conjure it in my head now. And, it, yeah. it, and it's not one of the main Star Trek themes or a variant on the main Star Trek themes. It's equally memorable. Yeah, I feel like the rest of the, the sort of scores are just, you know, nondescript space noises. Whereas the First Contact theme is mm. is definitely memorable. And it, it's, yeah, it's got its own sort of energy. I think, I think one of the weaknesses, and I think... I, I think I sort of realised this at the time in the late nineties and early noughties watching them. I th- I'm sure I've seen a critic of, of Star Trek point out somewhere on the internet that one of the problems with the TNG movies is actually the wealth of TNG itself. You know, in terms mm. of uh, uh, thematic uh, heft, but also just just runtime. Because one of the things that makes the original series six movies work well is that you actually don't know the crew that well at all, really. Yeah. Although for some of the ancillary characters that doesn't really change much of the movies you get this sense of fraternity particularly between Kirk, Spock and McCoy that's deepened and and, and there is this you, 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 there's stuff to explore there there's, there's uncharted territory whereas with Star Trek The Next Generation and maybe particularly with the captain of All Good Things mm. you, you don't need much more of that really and and certainly and if you did I'd, I'd, I'd argue the movies don't provide it. Yeah I think um, you've got to justify coming back with any kind of narrative after you concluded your main narrative. So because all of the TNG movies sort of follow on from us having our conclusion and our closure in TNG, you need to justify taking us back there. It needs to be good enough for that, especially since, as we discussed, the All Good Things closed TNG so well for us 
you are opening up that wound again if you're going to make a movie with that cast and i need it needs to be absolutely worth it i think generations is kind of inoffensive because it sort of like exists sort of a step out of time with everything um and it's just it is kind of and in and that fine enjoyable nostalgia piece you know in other you killing off data mm. Mm. i i i was kind of ready consent. to be done with him I was ready to be done with him by the end of those movies. What? <laughs> well, by the end of those movies? So you mean after he got his emotion chip and was insufferable? That yeah. was the point you killed him off in your head? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was dead to me. Well, I mean, t- to be fair, he only really has the emotion chip for generations, doesn't he? Although although mm. I'd, argue, I'd argue in First Contact he sort of informally does because because the bald queen is, is definitely triggering <laughs> things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. For him. But I mean, I think in... Um, Date is obviously one of the most important characters in TNG and one of the most o- important overarching storylines is his attempts to achieve emotion and it doesn't really work for him in Generations because it's just arbitrarily he doesn't know how to control it he's just laughing his head off like he's high as soon as he gets it and then he he can't cope with it and he wants to turn it off um, but when he sort of autonomously learns emotion. That's so much more meaningful. And he, yeah, he gets to the point where he sort of sacrifices himself to save everyone. And there's a there's a sense that he meaningfully achieved that. So I mean, so there is some some sort of big meaningful things that happen. But I still don't think those movies are good enough for the for me for me to allow them to kill data for it. Yeah, well, I, I think, so thinking back briefly to the TOS movies, the ones that tend to get raved about and largely deservedly so are, are, are kind of, you know, the, the, the three ones that start with Wrath of Khan and with The Voyage Home and, and then probably more The Undiscovered Country as well. And it's, it's kind of because big dramatic um, relationship changing things are happening to the characters, you know, that, mm. that could happen on a movie scope. And obviously there's loads of action, adventure and comedy and everything and all of those, you know, but, yeah. but these big things are happening. One thing I thought on rewatching the four TNG movies was that, you know, because c- Data dies at the very tail end, but that it's not really, it's not really part of anything. Really, it's it's not yeah. really part of any drama. And and one thing that I noticed on this rewatch is there's just a real in all the films really there's a real lack of dramatic uh, interaction between the actual characters, that between our main cast, so to mm. speak. Because I was thinking, I think we were we were talking about both um, First Contact and Insurrection, and I was talking yeah. we were talking about how the crew is is split up in both those. You know, to some of the crew are on the ship. Um, some of them are on the on the planet. In fact, it's kind of done in an inverse way in First Contact: Insurrection, isn't it? Where Picard is is uh, largely ship bound uh, in yeah. First Contact, and then it's the reverse uh, with with Riker being ship bound in Insurrection. But one thing that I noticed, apart from the sort of um, you know when, when Picard in First Contact is 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 dealing with his Borg trauma, he starts he starts snapping at the crew, and he, he you know he nearly has a, 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 fight, a fight with Worf. Um, yeah. Apart from that, there's there's not really much conflict in in the movies between the actual characters there's no you know i was saying to you when we watched insurrection the thing that would make this meaningful would be if half the crew was towing the federation line however reluctantly and the other half weren't you know it's it, yeah. it's easy to point at say um the, the the marvel movie civil war now isn't it and look at how that yeah happen. um there's yeah. nothing like that really in any of them there's no real there's nothing to do with the characters in conflict with each other however briefly there's no catharsis yeah. I th- but I think one of the, the special things about TNG is quite how, like throughout the series, quite how close knit that crew is, and they get closer and closer throughout. And by the time you get to all the things, everyone, including Picard, is is involved in the in the poker game. So you get this this sense that you know any kind of conflicts have been resolved by this point. So whilst I take that you know there isn't any conflict, and that's not a very good narrative kind of thing, don't break my family up don't come at, come at me with these post series films and start inserting conflict into mm. a situation that all good things did very very well to resolve mm, that's true and I, sp- I suppose to be honest you, could, you, you if i was more honest about the tos movies you could say a lot of that conflict is just external as well you know i mean that you know you might get irascible characters like mccoy but you basically you know external harm is done to the unit and and the yeah and then the familial bonds are restored you know through through loss and and suffering and trial but it, it's not it's not to do with them falling out with each other yeah you know? yeah I, I think i think again we run up against the problem that uh, the problem of success in a sense because 
All Good Things is such a good finale. And particularly that future element of All Good Things so nicely and delicately points to a possible ongoing, almost eternal future for TNG. The problem yeah. is when you fill it with, when, when you say, oh, anything could happen to them, anything could happen to them next. And then the answer is, and then you ask, well, what did happen though? And the answer is the, <laughs> the TNG movies. It's inevitably yes. disappointing, isn't it? Yeah, of course. And you, you do essentially, it, you know, All Good Things really answered our questions for the future of them but you know we know like we said we know that jean luc and beverly get together and we know they break up but then but then it's left with us that you know any of these futures are possible and they're all okay because we've got faith in these characters that they're going to be all right going faith forward of the heart. faith of yes. the heart would you say <laughs> no i would not say it because i know it's worse <laughs> um yeah but then it just sort of um, picks the the scab off that wound really that, mm. to to make further further movies. And I'm not saying there's they, they never should have done anything. And like I said, first contact I think is important in terms of just the the overall Star Trek canon mm. to to tell that story. But yeah, I think you you do there's a very sensitive way that you've got to go about dealing with these fandoms that <laughs> some invested in these characters that you've essentially laid to rest. Mm. I was I was talking to you, wasn't I, when we were talking about I was trying. Well, I think I was trying to pick flaws in Star Star Trek: First Contact because it is very entertaining. But mm. I think I was I was the one saying to you that I what I'd really like not so so, so Alfred Woodard uh, plays Lily in Star Trek: First Contact, and um, I don't mean to <laughs> devalue, especially when you have a prominent black actress in in Star Trek, you know, play yeah. any sort of role. I don't want to devalue that. Um, but she is, you know, she's allowing Picard to bounce his thoughts off her. That's basically her plot function. You know, she's kind of a a companion. Actually, again, a very Doctor Who sort of yeah. companion esque figure in that sense. But but I think there's a real problem at the heart of um, First Contact, and I think that's the absence of of Crusher as having meaningful input. And the the reason, the main reason for that is that she is his friend, his like love lover essentially, or you know, yeah. frustrated lover, and also his doctor during the assimilation crisis. So she she's absolutely everyone who should be, you know, the the, the famous scene that that most people like where he's. Uh, he yells at Lily and breaks the the display cabinet and and mm. you know really goes off in a, a tirade. I I feel like it should be Beverly Crusher in that room at that point. She's got every single level of authority, personal and and you know rank related and and care caring and familial and everything to be the one who's talking to him at that point. You son of a bitch! This really isn't the time. Okay, I don't know Jack about the 24th century, but everybody out there thinks that staying here and fighting the Borg is suicide. They're just afraid to come in here and say it. The crew is accustomed to following my orders. They're probably accustomed to your orders making sense. None of them understand the Borg as I do. No one does. No one can. What is that supposed to mean? Six years ago. They assimilated me into their collective. I had their cybernetic devices implanted throughout my body. I was linked to the hive mind. Every trace of individuality erased. I was one of them. So you can imagine, my dear, I have a somewhat unique perspective on the board, and I know how to fight them. Now, if you will excuse me, I have work to do. I am such an idiot. It's so simple. The Borg hurt you, and now you're going to hurt them back. In my century, we don't succumb to revenge. We have a more evolved sensibility. Bullshit! I saw the look on your face when you shot those Borg on the holodeck. You were almost enjoying it. How dare you? Oh, come on, Captain. You're not the first man to get a thrill from murdering someone. I see it all the time. Get out! Or what? You'll kill me? Like you killed Ensign Lynch? There was no way to save him. You didn't even try. Where was your involved sensibility then? I don't have time for this. Oh, hey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt your little quest. Captain Ahab has to go hunt his whale. What? You do have books in the 24th century. This is not about revenge. Liar! This is about saving the future of humanity! John, look, blow up the damn ship! No! No! I will not sacrifice the Enterprise. We may 
too many compromises already, too many retreats. They invade our space, and we fall back. They assimilate entire worlds, and we fall back. Not again. The line must be drawn here, this far, no farther. for what they've done. You broke your little ships. Yeah, but, but the thing is, we we don't. It, I mean, talking about the all good things future, the what that we don't see the future where they're married, and divorced, which obviously would be a different sort of timeline from the the one. But we, you know, we don't see what happens. From what I sort of infer from her absence from the the future sort of films and from Picard, is that basically some shit went down. And mm. she can't be there. That you know that perhaps Picard's trauma was too great for her to deal with. Perhaps that perhaps their shared trauma, going right back from you know um, Picard delivering Jack Crush's body to her after he dies under his command, maybe all of that is just too big, and maybe she just absolutely has to check out of her relationship with Picard because I mean the, the guy's sort of like you can see him learning to live with his trauma. But it's not resolved. Mm. He's still he's still a very very troubled man, and I can imagine that their relationship was volatile and in it, many it, ways and really sad that it ultimately couldn't withstand the the trauma that they shared. Yeah, no, I agree, and I, I think uh, I mean we'll, we'll, we promised our listeners back in episode two that we talk a little bit more about Star Trek Picard. That's concluded, so we'll we'll move on to that shortly. But um, <laughs> I think uh, we obviously may end up with Gates McFadden being in in. Star Trek Picard because it's an ongoing series for better or for worse. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I know Geordie's supposed to be coming back in the series too, but I mean, I, it just feels like they're just wheeling people out for the sake of it now. <laughs> mm, yeah. Oh well, I, I think we're I think we're not going to be that sparing, are we, in discussing Picard? And again, we'll have things about all good things to say in, in that respect. Yeah. If you had to, um, if you had to, and you know, this is just the sort of arbitrary thing that I sometimes enjoy and and, and listeners sometimes like. Um, if you had to. Uh, arbitrarily rank the TNG movies just for just for you as a personal take. What would you What would your ordering be? Um, first Contact's my favourite, um, just because of the story that it tells. I don't, I, feel, I don't know. I feel a weird kind of connection to First Contact. I, don't, I, I just think it's especially for the time that it was released and a lot of the other kind of sci-fi that was about that time. It was, you know, things like Independence Day were coming out, and you know, yeah, there was this idea of like what would contact with aliens be but if you've grown up with star trek it's like well obviously it's going to be between vulcans and humans that's Mm. it and you know it's just good to see that played out in the explicit way that they did it um so it is my favorite and it is a very entertaining watch and is a picard movie and one that deals really really well with his trauma which is the most important theme in tnj for me then after that so first contact for second probably generations Mm. um it, I, th- I just think it's I, the the other three are sort of almost interchangeable. They're all just fine. <laughs> Generations, well, in, 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 you know. Insurrection and uh, Nemesis. And yeah, well, I mean, well Gen- Generations is just above Insurrections and Nemesis. And to be honest, Insurrection and Nemesis are quite interchangeable for me. If you had to, if you had to Probab- arbitrarily put one fourth, what would that what would that be? Probably. I don't know. Maybe maybe arbitrarily Nemesis, just because of the. The can you know it concludes things in in some way. Well, also you fell asleep um, during think... the rewatch, so you've still got to watch the second half of it. Yeah, <laughs> I did fell asleep during that, but I mean that was a because it is kind of boring. Oh, it's all B because I had had a I had had a few beers. <laughs> but I mean at least at least stuff happens in it. I I think you know, for all its flaws and for all it being boring, it is telling quite a specific story with a beginning, middle and end and I don't think I get that from Insurrection. 
Mr. Worf, do you know Gilbert and Sullivan? No, sir. I have not had a chance to meet all the new crew members since I have been back. They're composers, Worf. From the 19th century. Data was rehearsing a production of HMS Pinafore just before he left. A British tar is a soaring soul, as free as a mountain bird. His energetic fist should be ready to resist a dictatorial word. Sing, walk, sing. His nose should pant. And his lips should curl. His cheeks should flame. And his brow should furl. His bosom should heave. And his heart should glow. And, and his, his fist be ever ready for a knockdown blow. His nose should pant, and his lips should curl, his cheek should flame, and his brow should curl, his bosom should heave, and his heart should glow, and his fist be ever ready for a knockdown blow. Prepare the doggy claps. His eye should flash with an inborn fire, his brow with scorn be wrong. He never should bow down to a domineering frown, or the, the tang of a tired tongue. tongue. His heart should stump, and his throat should growl. His hair should curl, and his face should scowl. His eyes should flash, and his breast protrude. And this should be his customary attitude. His foot should stamp, and his throat should growl. His hair should curl, and his face should... Yeah, well, you do have to be, to an extent, you have to be honest about which ones you'd want to rewatch again next, wouldn't you? Like, yeah. If, I, if yeah. I honestly think about that. First contact is at the top. I, you know, I've got some issues with it. Um, I, I've never been, never mm. been a fan of the Borg Queen. I, I think even when I first saw it, I, I mean, I saw it, I suppose when I first saw it at the age of, you know, what, 12 or something, I thought it was cool, you know, but I didn't, yeah. I already had qualms, I think, about, about the, the, the decollectivization of the Borg, you know, and I think, I think there's material in, in just discussing the Borg for a whole other podcast. Um, I'm very, very yeah. fond of Generations, um, but it, it doesn't, it, it works better in the memory. It's kind of like playing a Sonic the Hedgehog game, really. It, it works better in the memory than in the yeah. practice. And with the other two, I, I, yeah. I, I actually... So I found, I found Insurrection kind of admirable but in its themes, but dull in execution. And I quite liked... Mm. Uh, this is the thing that surprised me most, actually. I quite liked the first half of... Um, or the first third, maybe, of, of Nemesis. Basically everything up till they, they meet Tom Hardy's character, Shinzon. And then yeah. it was just, and then it was just trash, really. It was just, it was just. Yeah, th- it we, is a very trashy film. Oh, it's so. We we talked, and we were messaging a little bit about just how ill-conceived the entire Shinzon as clone of Picard thing is. It just means yeah. means nothing, you know. It's yeah, just, it is entirely meaningless. It's a really inane a, a, approach to it. Um, it's it just feels really poorly thought through. Mm. And that's before you get to things like the Doom Buggy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's so ridiculous that film, isn't it? We were talking. We were talking it, the other day about um, season one of TNG being a, a, a sort of peak of uh, go home Star Trek. You're dr- you're drunk. Uh, yes, but, exactly. But I think the Doom Buggy in Nemesis might be might be a resurgence of that, a, a late flowering of that. Yeah, I, I think with the, with the season season one of TNG, it just doesn't know who it is yet it doesn't know what it wants to be and you can feel you can watch it figure itself out because it's got a whole season in which to do it and then what you end up with at the end of season one moving in season two is quite you know it's it's got a decent sense of identity but then when like if you're looking at the likes of interaction it's 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 back in that mode where it's trying to figure out who it is but it just doesn't have the time to figure it out because it's only it's short of two hours Mm. It doesn't have time to figure out who it wants to be. And also, no one asked you to make this movie if you didn't know what you wanted to do with it. Like, mm. You could have just not made the movie if you didn't know what you wanted it to be. Well, I think, I think critics have pointed out that, you know, another thing that makes the TOS movies work is that um, you, you, it was coming back after a while. You know, there was, a, there was at least a fan hunger for it and I suppose like a wider commercial mm. uh, hunger for, for sci-fi post-Star Wars, you know, which obviously was, was the real yeah. reason it got, it got made. Um, with with the, with next generation, there was the, it was it was the opposite. To make it slight, slightly commercial, there was there was um, a surfeit, wasn't there? It was a, a product of of Star Trek and no thirst for new TNG other than just continuity, you know. Yeah. Um, so there's nothing. I can actually imagine. I think. I can imagine a sort of mid noughties return for the TNG crew. I mean, it may not have been good, but I can imagine the sort of public hunger for it and excitement about it. 
Yeah, I think because immediately after TNG, you had they, they made Generations, DS9 was happening, but Voyager was already in the works when TNG ended. So we got completely saturated. And I also think the creative staff behind Star Trek got a bit sort of overwhelmed and put out some trash shit movies, essentially. Mm. Also, we'd lost the guidance of Gene Roddenberry because yeah. he died whilst TNG was being made. So you can see it sort of lose direction because people didn't yeah everyone involved didn't know what they wanted to achieve maybe the the public wasn't asking clearly for what it wanted because it didn't really want anything mm. specifically so i mean the there's i think i would characterize the four tng movies as entertaining in different degrees but ultimately needless mm. yeah that's no that's a good, really good summary um I mean, to be fair to Gene Roddenberry, he was always a man. He was not always a man who had a vision, but he was always a man who could successfully bluff having had a vision in retrospect. Yes. I thought you were going to say, like, in fairness to Gene Roddenberry, he was dead when they were made, <laughs> <laughs> as if I was slagging him off. For in his defence, he was nowhere near the cottage at that time. <laughs> I, um, it, what, what, I think, I mean, you were talking before about the creative stuff being overwhelmed. We were watching Generations and just noticing that, I mean, I, I think others, have, many others have pointed this out, but there are scenes in Generations where the crew are wearing the wrong uniforms. Yes, yeah. Because we were watching and sort of like, obviously, extremely socially distanced because I'm in north of england and you're in london and um every now and again like, during our text exchange whilst watching it it would you would just pipe up with look at that uniform it's changed again <laughs> but <laughs> it was obviously it really annoying you it had. <laughs> tell the people <laughs> you're I mean, next it, it is inexplicable though that it kept changing because why did they have all those different units like it just seems simple enough to be like right, that is the uniform that everyone wears why did why did they change so much? I feel like they just got I don't know, Isabel. Some idiot seamstress in the costume <laughs> department who made a different iteration every time. Black Lock, the idiot seamstress. <laughs> underrated <laughs> underrated character. You, if you look carefully on the uh, credits, that's what someone's credited as. <laughs> idiot seamstress. So I'll um <laughs> I'll I'll just play a clip um and we'll um we'll get back to talking Oh, you know what? You know, I don't think I picked a favorite, a least favorite TNG movie. Yeah. Um, okay, so I've got First Contact, Generations, more for fondness than anything else. Uh, uh, Insurrection, you know, because I, I just don't think I can watch Nemesis ever again. <laughs> I don't really want to watch Insurrection again either, but I think... You don't works. have to. I won't make you. That's, that, I'll hold you to that, mate. Good. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll just play a clip now and uh, we'll come back and talk a little bit about... Star Trek Picard. Cool. You're writing your own material. You're creating your own opportunities. This is my thinking. Yeah. I'm writing the screenplay, and um, I find the whole process absolutely exhilarating. What's it about, if you don't mind me asking? Well, uh, how best to explain it? You've seen me in X Men. Yeah. Uh, the character I am, Professor Charles Xavier. Mm. If you remember, he can control things with the power of his mind, can yeah. make people do things and see things. So I thought, what if. You can do that for real. I mean, not in a comic book world, but in the real world. All right. So in my film, I play a man who controls the world with his mind. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. For instance, um, I'm walking along, and um, I see this beautiful girl, and I think I'd like to see her naked, and so all her clothes fall off. All her clothes fall off? Mm, yes. And she's scrabbling around to get them back on again, but even before she can get her knickers on, I've seen everything. You know, I've seen it all. Okay. It's a comedy, is it? No. It's about what would happen, you know, if these things were possible. What's the story, though? What's the... Well, uh, I do other stuff. Like, I'm riding my bike in the park, and this policewoman says, Oi, you can't ride your bike on the grass! And I go, oh, no. And her uniform falls off, and she goes, ah! And she's trying to cover up, but I've seen everything. Anyway, and I get on my bike, I ride off. On the grass. So... It's mainly you sort of go around seeing ladies' tits. Mainly. Mm. And I do other stuff, like um, I go to the World Cup final, and uh, it's Germany versus England, and I wish that I were playing. And suddenly I am, and I score the winning goal, and they carry me into the dressing room, and there's Rooney and Beckham, and then Posh Spice walks in. and Her clothes fall off? Instantly. Sure. And she, she doesn't know what's happening. Uh, but uh, I've seen, seen everything. everything. Again. Good. Is there a narrative at all? Is there like a story 
in the, in the film, or is it just... Well, I'm a sort of uh, James Bond figure. Right. And I have to go to Iraq to rescue these hostages. And I get there, and I rescue them. But they're all women, and they're naked, because their clothes have rotted off. But I get them into the helicopter, and I'm flying in the helicopter. But I can still sneak a look in the mirror, and I can see everything. You know, one of them's bending over, two of them are kissing. If they're a lesbian? Yeah, because they've been in the camp for so long. It can happen. Well, look, uh, good luck with that. Um, I've just written a sitcom, but I wonder if you could give it to anyone you know, you know, mm, yes. film or TV. Is there any nudity in it? Any... Any nudity in it? Not really. Oh. Well, it could be. Men or women? Uh, either. Uh. Well, just women. Right. Well, I need a rewrite, but in the meantime, if you could give it to anyone that you know in TV or yes, film or... Yes, definitely. Yeah. I will make it so. You've seen Star Trek The Next Generation, have you? I haven't, no. Well, your wife won't let you have it on, has it? I'm not married. No. Uh, your girlfriend, then? I haven't got a girlfriend. I, li I live alone. You're not married. You haven't got a girlfriend. And you've never watched Star Trek? No. Good Lord. Welcome back, and uh, now me and Isabella are going to uh, talk a little bit by <laughs> huge popular demand <laughs> about the recent television show, if you will. <laughs> you don't even want to say it, do you? I don't really, and it's his name. How bad is that? I love saying yeah, his name. Yeah, I know. Uh, um, Star I'm talking, of course, about Star Trek Picard, which um, when we recorded episode two of this podcast um, was, I, I think it, it had about eight episodes out of ten. So me and Isabel felt that we couldn't really fairly judge its first season uh, without having seen the the whole thing, and uh, we have now. Uh, and what did you think of it, David? Fantastic! <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Um, no, I really didn't like it. Really, really yeah. did not like it. I, 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 I'd struggle. You know what? Because we, we have we have tried to be a bit positive here, and we've we've been talking about all the things which we both love. Um, mm. I'll try and find the best in it. I mean, it. Uh, um, I'm I'm genuine. You know what? I'm I'm not, I'm not, honestly not trying to be facetious about this. I'm I'm struggling because it start. The first episode started, and I within that first episode there were load loads of stylistic things and choices and things that I didn't like. And I was, but I was totally prepared to give it mostly the benefit of the doubt. I was, I was, yeah. I really did think it might pick up. And for me, it, for me, it, it truly didn't. It, it, it sort of squandered or bastardized everything <laughs> that I kind of liked about this. And I should claim, I'm not, um, I'm not upset about this because I'm not, um, I didn't want it. I didn't want yeah, it anyway. I didn't ask for it. Yeah. No, no, no. I wasn't. I we wasn't, said goodbye. Wasn't We've already it. said goodbye to Picard. Like all good things did what it needed to do for us years ago. Yeah. So I didn't need it. But I think if you were going to make a TV show called Star Trek Picard, which picks up, you know, the 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 future of a captain that we were so invested in, you, the, there is a specific fan base that's going to be interested in that. They, they mm. must be trying to appeal to that I think they let down definitely stylistically just that I mean just the way that it's shot is sort of incredibly modern like it's it's shot for a modern audience essentially yeah. a younger audience than us um but using characters and themes that are beloved by a completely different organ audience so yeah I just don't think it marries those two goals together very well no, I don't think it does either. I mean, I, I have to, what you say about the modern audience, I, 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 I'll i try and, <laughs> I'm so wary about it, appearing like the worst sort of fan here. I'm aware a younger audience of people are into Star Trek now. I'm aware yeah. a lot of those people came, not not even just Discovery, but like via uh, the, um, the, you know, the J.J. The Abrams, Kelvin Universe movies. And that's yeah. absolute, for the record, that's absolutely fine. More that is fine. I am, I am very happy for there being a new, the next generation of Star Trek fans um, out there. I'm very happy for them if they enjoy the stuff that I don't enjoy. Mm. But if we're going to talk about uh, all good things and how that ended the Picard saga and then how someone saw fit to pick that saga back up, I'm not going to sort of... I'm not going to pretend to be okay with it. And I think the... It was a, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to pretend to be okay with it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, 
I just think that I mean there's there's things that are, that are all right about it, all right. Which I ones? Think, so I think the things that it does well, to an extent, is it picks back up Picard's trauma storyline quite well. You see, you see Picard in this future where he is isolated and alone, um, apart from a couple of Romulans that he's mates with, and his dog Number One, which is adorable. Um, he's on the Picard uh, vineyard. Oh, I like the um, Irish Romulan. Sorry, I should get that in. The Irish, Irish Romulan, Romulan. All yeah. For the Irish Romulan. There you go. There Inexplicably you go. Irish Romulan. Yeah. So he's chilling um, at his vineyard. He's sort of isolated himself, not only from a lot of the people that he knows, but from Starfleet. One of the things that I dislike about Picard is that in the sort of graphic for the show, the word Picard, they use the Starfleet logo for the A, despite the fact that throughout the series, Picard is completely divorced from Starfleet. It just doesn't make sense. It seems tokenistic, and I think that is the that's the big downfall of the show as a whole, like the references to the previous series of Star Trek's TNG is tokenistic. They will just wheel Riker out, wheel Troy out. They will, you know, just make gestures that aren't particularly meaningful towards the series that we knew and loved. I touched on this in episode two, but I've, I've got a, I've had a big problem with Star Trek's stasis and sort of um, wallowing in its own past for, for, mm. for like li- literally decades now. You <laughs> yeah. know, it's really, it, I'm, not to, I'm not a victim, but this is, this is, this has been, <laughs> this has been quite tough, you know, cause I, cause I am someone who I'm not, I'm not, a, well, I'm not, I'm not like a, I'm not too attached to the thing. I obviously, I'm obviously like anyone who's getting a bit older. I've, we've got, I own my preferences. I own the stuff that came to me in childhood. I own, you know, my, my sort of um, sweet spots in terms of, you know, uh, comfort yeah. viewing, which is all fine. It's all fine. I, I, I know that. But I am someone who got into the new Doctor Who series in 2005 without any precedent of being a Whovian. And I, I'm aware that I'm now, by complaining about Star Trek Picard and Discovery, I'm, I'm sort of being a bit of a gatekeeper, you know, like whether I mean to be or not, yeah. I'm, I'm doing that a bit. But I, I do have to be honest about my opinion here. And I think, I think Star Trek Picard, although it's, it's an, a new series, which is the thing I've been begging for for decades, which is something that moves you on in time chronologically in the Star Trek universe and starts to explore a future. Yeah. As you hint, it's, it's still, it's, it's, it's handling it with kit gloves, isn't it? It's, it's still really afraid to lay down any sort of canonical track about the Federation and what's going on. And it's, it, I, mm. I think the, the most egregious thing for me about Star Trek Picard was it, there's all this talk about Discovery and Picard reaching for the sort of era of prestige television, you know, reaching for serialization, reaching for complexity. But yeah. they, they kind of, they, they seem like they've had kind of lobotomies as TV shows. You know, they, they seem like they've, they seem like they're filled instead with willful ignorance of, of the, of the complexity of TV. And I'm not talking about, you know, Shakespeare. I'm talking about them being up to the level of a good series of Battlestar Galactica or, or The Expanse. Yeah. You know, they just don't seem to, or, or, you know, or, I know Doctor Who is a very different show, but all, all the best seasons of Doctor Who, you know, it, they, 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 they kind of seem like they're not really aware of them, um, like post Buffy television in some ways, you know, <laughs> yeah. despite the fact they're paying lip service to elements of it. Yeah, I, well, I think the, the issue, it, it, I think Picard is very style over substance, which is something that you will get with a lot of TV shows these days. You know, they want to do big fight scenes, big explosions, show off how great the graphics they've got are. Uh, and all that kind of thing. Um, I think one of the issues with Picard is that nothing happens. So, I, I mean, I started watching it wanting to see the best in it because I was happy to see my captain again. And like, I just, I wanted, I wanted to enjoy it. And I, I did sort of, I, I did enjoy that they brought back themes to do with um, artificial intelligence, um, like the old political landscape of, you know, tensions with the Romulans and stuff that, that's nice sort of nostalgia, but it didn't push any of those things anywhere interesting. Yeah, so they, they laid all, in the first few episodes, I was kind of like, okay, um, it's not what I expect. Stylistically, it's weird. Okay, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. Episode four, five, six. Mm. They're going, and nothing happens. They will just, they'll keep rolling out like sort of old characters and old themes, but then letting them fester in front of you on screen series didn't go anywhere at all for me yeah it had the problem where it got no more interesting and and a, a lot more stupid didn't it yeah 
I still it can't. Was, you, you were praising the AI involvement. I mean, I, I, I mean, to an extent, yeah, it's, it's good when they're they're reaching for something to say. But I, I can't believe. I mean, the the finale would deserve its own episode. But oh I, God, the space tentacle portal thing. Yeah, I, what I can't. I could actual, not believe that. Yeah. When I was watching it, this is what is because uh, again, caveat, just to show I've got some sense of proportion. Star Trek's obviously always been full of silly stuff. That all yeah. good things features anti time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, you've got a problem with anti time. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I just just to show that I've got some some sense of self awareness. But you know, it, it just it, it didn't mean anything. It didn't it didn't have any stakes grounded in any of the characters. Uh, I still don't really understand what Picard was thinking for any of the show because in in all good things he's got meaningful. He's got he's got a meaningful mission. He's got meaningful imperatives. He's got a ticking clock of, to an extent. He's got his um, faculties that he's struggling with. You know, he's got all this stuff going on and. In, mm. in Picard, they, they attempt to project this background of uh, guilt and inaction, which seems to sort of clumsily to be trying to speak to our sort of present uh, geopolitical time in the vaguest possible way. Yeah, yeah. And also, just don't ever insinuate to me that Picard is not the best man. Don't, <laughs> don't make a TV show about his his failings. And here we have it. <laughs> did, what did you, I mean... Because, because I think some people who even even people who didn't like Star Trek Picard, uh, some some of them quite liked the the fact that they brought Brent Spiner back to to play Data again, and some people quite liked that last mm. scene that takes place in a sort of VR hard drive essentially between Picard and Data. I didn't, yeah. but d- did you did you find any solace in that at all? Um, no, not at that point because it, I mean it just got so stupid (laughs) by that point I I was just really uninvested in it I mean the most sort of emotionally drawing scene for me was the very first one where um Picard is sort of in his mind playing is he playing they're playing some kind of game one of those Star Trek games I don't know which one it is Mm. Uh, it may just be in chess but yeah they're they're playing and then sort of the explosions go off behind them and just seeing that those two actors interact together in those sort of familiar circumstances, but then everything explodes and it just explodes into something else. It kind of lost lost it for me quite quite quickly. I kept an open mm. mind for as long as I could, but get halfway through that series and, and just nothing is happening yeah. at all. Um, and it becomes harder and harder to emotionally invest in it. And it's just, I mean, there's that, when we were speaking about all good things earlier, and I, I mentioned that there was that frantic energy to future Picard. You do get quite a bit of that in Star Trek Picard. There is a different energy about that character, but because everything else is so jarring and different, mm. it's harder to ex- accept the different energy that that character has because there's no constant, there's no control measure in there. It's, it's just like Star Trek soup. Yeah. Loads <laughs> of other elements in there. That's, that's actually a really great subtitle. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, for anyone who's listened to this after our Voyager episode, uh, we should probably mention Jerry Ryan uh, a little bit. Always a pleasure. Yeah, um, we do like mentioning Jerry Ryan. We sure do. I, I, I can't. I, I mean, I think in some ways she's, she's less of a problem in it. Uh, it's still not good, the, the use they make of the seven character in this, I think. But it, it's kind of less egregious because they've, they've at least just decided to turn her into a hard drinking kind of sub Lara Croft bounty hunter yeah it's one of those things you know i was saying that you you know you've got to have a good reason to to reopen those wounds when you've got closure with the character we i mean not that the closure to voyager was brilliant anyway Mm. um but she was on a when you leave seven she's on a journey towards finding her humanity again becoming an individual again and you want to believe that she's got happiness ahead of her down that path she's doing well and then you rediscover her and she's just very broken and troubled and traumatized and it's not what you wanted for her mm. uh, but they've, they've built it's like that character could have been anyone that didn't have to be seven you didn't have to do that to seven of nine you didn't have to break her and traumatize her and put her in that role if you had faith in your script writing you could have used any character rather than wheel out a beloved co- character for mm. our generation of Trek fans and break her. You didn't have to. And also her Borg implants look shit. It would be interesting. Again, you kind of need the, uh, you need the structure of 
Starfleet to, to for these characters to interact meaningfully, I think. Um, and it, so, because if, if they brought kind of the same way they do with Janeway and Nemesis, you know, for briefly, if, if you brought Seven back in a bit more detail, but if you brought Seven back and she's now, you know, an admiral or something, if she's yeah. the one who argues against Picard traveling, for example, in mm. a measured way, and, and then, because then you can really, you know, to be fair, they briefly try and create a bit of a bond between Picard and, and, and Seven based on the on the Borg. Experience. Yeah, their shared experience of being in the collective. They do, and that was, you know, all right. So I was trying to say nice things about it. That that what that one. I think that was my equivalent of the data farewell scene. Actually, because it was the one scene that just kind of works in isolation. Is the one at the end of the seven yeah. episode where they she talks about whether you ever get back to normal. After yeah. Do you ever get your? Did you ever get your humanity back? Yes, completely. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which is really sad, you know, it, it, sad and complicated, and and it sounded it hits. However, briefly, it hits some of those levels of kind of emotional maturity we were talking about, doesn't it? You know, yeah, and yeah, and the definitely. feeling of time behind these characters. Yeah, definitely, and I, I, it just picks up that trauma theme, which I think is really important to the whole thing, as I keep saying. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 I'm, that is what I, you know, if you tell me they're making a new Star Trek series, it's going to pick up Picard and Seven of Nine in the future. That is the kind of thing that I want. That's what I want to see. I want to see them connecting over the Borg. But I want more than that. I want them to learn from me. You know, she lived in the Borg collective and then became human. He lived as a human, then joined the collective. Where do those experiences marry up? How can they help heal each other's experiences? But you didn't get that. You got sort of, again, a tokenistic interaction where they reference it and then they don't revisit it. I think one of the strangest things about Star Trek Picard is, is that um, Patrick Stewart as Picard is both sidelined in, in the narrative and in the show and bizarrely disproportionately central in, in and, and i don't know how it manages those two things at once but he's sidelined in the sense that he's often tangential to the action and the nonsense of a plot that that constitute the yeah. first season but he's, he's he's ridiculously central in the sense that this show bears his name and it rather than having him bow out gracefully having patrick stewart bow out gracefully the franchise at the end of this series mm. for better, you know whether, whether people liked it or not that that would be it for him in the same way that it looks like it is at least for brent spiner as data um, he doesn't. They they give him this um, non-eternal but but refreshed android body, and kind of suggest that he's around for the foreseeable. You know, and it's so bizarre. It's it's. Kind of, I was just yeah. thinking about it. It's kind of in the same way that generations successfully or otherwise passes the torch. It's like if um if at the end of generations Kirk is um under the the, the broken bridge and Picard's pick him up, and he just springs back to life, and yeah. is now just part of the crew. You know, it seems I to be the opposite of what it should do. I think. It, it, it is just it's nonsense because a big part of Picard's journey as a person and with all of his Borg trauma is having faith in his humanity and then and but part of humanity is mortality and that's one of the things that his best mate Data kind of had to deal with when he was sort of going through his but I would give it all up to be human and you have to face his own mortality and that kind of fear Picard, it just seems really uh, arbitrary that he just goes, cool, I'll, I'll be a robot then. Mm. I mean, I, I suppose I, I read critics of the final episode saying that, that the show does undercut its own message by having Data say, say all that stuff and be switched off and then, and then Picard in the same breath, Picard coming back, back yeah. to life. Um, I, I, I think I can, if I stretch, I can give the show credit that it doesn't necessarily need to be contradictory. It can be, it can be, it can be deliberately contradictory as a dark irony. You know, I, I, yeah. I allow that uh, to give it some credit. It can, it can be, Picard can learn that from data as a truth and then be confronted by the ironic horror that he himself is, is back. I, yeah, I think, I, I mean, 10 episodes isn't enough for a Star Trek series. Was it 10 episodes? It was yeah, 10 episodes, it was, it was 10, it? Yeah. That's not enough. And it's not enough to pick that character up that we haven't seen for a long time. We all reopen all of his emotional wounds and close them again properly. We reopened them. We didn't, we unpacked all of these trauma boxes and then just put all that shit back in those boxes and put it in a mechanical body to carry on. I could have accepted him moving forward if, if we got a real sense that he dealt with his personal trauma and he was beginning his life anew. You know, that he'd spent most of his life unable to live, withdrawn, keeping everyone at arm's length, like we'd seen, that would make sense with his entire history throughout TNG. If he'd spent his whole life restricted by his trauma, but through the medium of the plot of Picard, he managed to unpack and heal that trauma and he was ready to begin anew. 
Mm. And it was his second chance that he deserved because of everything that he'd been through and everything he'd sacrificed to save other people. Mm. I could accept that. But I didn't see him heal his trauma at all. And I saw the same guy pile more trauma on top of his existing trauma and then just prolonging it in a robot body. Mm. Great idea. Nice to see Jonathan Frakes and Marina Sirtis again there, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I should say I didn't. I didn't. I didn't like that episode either. <laughs> I should say for the record, but I, I liked. I, you know, just the, just the emotional heft of seeing them was nice in isolation. Yeah, yeah, it was nice. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I think I didn't like Picard's attitude. Right, you know, these are his best friends, his oldest friends, everyone that he gets in touch with. He only gets in touch with when he needs something, and you don't get a sense after you've chilled with them that they're going to commence a new meaningful relationship and the idea of family that we get at the end of all good things like you you've destroyed that now because we know that that's not what they get going mm. forward then then they don't remain close and i that's what i need i wanted to believe that i wanted to believe that they built a family on that ship and that was forever yeah, well, this is the, that's this is not the, what happens. This is the thing again, isn't it? You know, to, to to give well, not to give the show credit, but just to to allow it for our um, uh, foibles. You know, we we are we we are partly angry at it because it's overwriting that lovely potential future with an actual future, isn't it? And it is disappointing us as such. I think I think what I I the, my overall impression of Picard in in Star Trek Picard was I, he he came across as because I've talked before about how I've got no problem with him being a flawed character or and even an irascible and difficult character. He yeah. kind of seemed a bit stupid in Star Trek Picard. Yeah, but naive sometimes. Yeah, uh, for sure. You know, like when he turns up on that um, Romulan colony that he's got friends at, but he doesn't realise how much everyone hates him for abandoning them. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, he he seems incredibly naive, and maybe that's just like a frailty of him being old and and out of it, sort of. Yeah. yeah. He, he never he never seemed like someone who didn't know how the world worked, though. Picard, did he? That was that was never his detachment was never that sort of detachment. Yeah, he was always like um, irrational, and he, he, if withdrawn, empathetic character. He like he understood how people felt about things all the time. Mm. And yeah, he, and you don't get that. Yeah, there's elements of his character that have changed somewhat in, inexplicably in the way that he's represented in Picard. Mm. Which... You, know, you know the way they set up that he's got a um a specific illness that's kind of cured by the android body. I think yeah. it was a crayon in his brain, like Homer Simpson. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so I think it should be called Star Trek Crayon in the Brain. <laughs> Why I laugh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, I think we'll leave it there. Um, I, I'll I, I should say I, I'll probably <laughs> who am I kidding? I'm going to watch Star Trek Picard season two if we ever get it. Um, yeah. I'll probably watch Star Trek yes, Discovery. Yes, I heard that Geordie's going to be in it. I imagine they're just going to wheel out as many people as possible for it. I can't. Yeah. I do want to see where they go with it. Even with very limited expectations, I do want to see where they go with it. And then yeah. you, it's. I do kind of like getting annoyed at these things. That's entertaining for me at the very least. Yeah, it's fun. I can own that catharsis. I mean, it, it, it's also. I've, I've kind of accepted that. Um, Patrick Stewart as Jean-Luc Picard is kind of he's kind of the Kermit the Frog of the sci-fi world you know like you you want to see him get the gang back together um and yeah, I yeah. I'll, I'll I would watch that it won't it won't be it won't be good calories in a sense but I'll I'll, I'll take them <laughs> yeah that's exactly how I feel actually well put <laughs> yeah anyway anyway uh it's been lovely to lovely to talk to you Isabel um thank you so yes, much for joining me nice. yeah thanks it's um it's always great to talk about Star Trek and I'm sure we'll be back uh, before too long to talk about uh some other aspects of the franchise uh and indeed about other things um so uh until next time uh say goodbye as well bye and see you all soon you've been listening to the escape goat podcast hosted by david blake fagiani if you want to contact the podcast with any feedback or thoughts you can leave comments on our lipson page or under our youtube videos or email us at escapegoatpod at gmail.com you can also reach the show on Twitter on at egoat underscore pod and follow us for new episode notifications or get me personally on at dbfagiani. This podcast is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well as our Libsyn site escapegoatpodcast.libsyn.com Original intro, outro and any other incidental music for this podcast is composed, produced and made available by permission of Richard Gilbert. 